welcome back to uh, Joey. Joe um, is with us and is going to be moderating the next session. So as we open this morning at 6.45 in California, um, we said that we had people absolutely from all over the world. We traveled uh, to Europe, we came back to the US, and now we are on to Australia with the great uh, Danny Nolan. I have known personally Danny for probably uh, 15 years. Um, we used to see each other at probably all the shows around the world. That Danny, uh, like Ray, just uh, you know earlier, is a terrific engineer who has that talent, like Ray, to explain very complicated things in a very simple way. So I am delighted to have Danny uh, uh, do a full session on chassis simulation. And so uh, we have one more minute. And uh, so what time is it for you, Danny? It's a Tuesday morning. Over there. It's about it's bang on eleven a.m. Sydney time. Oh, so uh, but you guys drink early in Australia, so it's all. Yeah, well, yeah, right? it's eleven a.m., but we're uh, forward a day. <laughs> so you've got you cross the time machine, otherwise known as the international date line. Okay, so it is four o'clock here, Daddy. So you on for the next fifty minutes with uh, Joe Castillo, our host today. So thank you for being with us, everyone. Enjoy the show. No worries. Thanks, Francis. He always mentions drinking in every segue. I just want to... <laughs> everyone. Everyone. He's, dead, he's five for five so far, which I love that. Uh, and to everybody out there watching on ePartsTrade.com and who have signed up for this, what a great day one. There's going to be so much more to come. Uh, Tuesday morning, Ron Caps, Antron Brown will be starting bright and early. It is going to be great. But I am thrilled to talk chassis sim, Danny because it's the perfect piggyback to Ray and the previous seminar with the uh, CFD. You're taking, he's, he's creating data, but you take data and have created a simulator. Let's start off at the beginning though, your career, mid nineties, you've been involved in many different forms of motorsport. You did a, a master's degree that ultimately became chassis sim, which is now a tool that helps race engineers. So there's a lot to go. Obviously, we're all learning along the way, but let's go to the beginning. How did you get started in this field that you love so much? Well, here's the, well, thank you, Joe, for that praiseworthy and eloquent, an eloquent introduction. Here's how I got started. I was always going to be one of these kids that was either going to play around with fighter, uh, with fighter aircraft or F1 cars. And um, so I did aerospace engineering at Sydney Uni and um, sort of if I wasn't breathing fighter aircraft, I was breathing race cars. Anyway, um, the Cold War ended. Um, um, uh, the Cold War ended. Um, uh, Ayrton Senna hit the wall at Imola, and so I figured that um, uh, my career as a fighter aircraft designer was going to be very, very short-lived. So I sold my soul to the devil, ran away and joined the circus, and I've been doing motor racing ever since. So I got my start doing Formula Ford, um, you know, just, uh, you know, swinging spanners, um, you know, uh, to midnight uh, for the equivalent of a meat pie and a beer um, in Australia, albeit I don't drink, so in my case, it was a meat pie and a lemonade. Um, uh, or should I say a um, soda for our North American, um, uh, for our North American viewers, um, then went to Europe, worked in um, F3, um, then, um, free, uh, then Formula 3000, which would become the forerunner of GP2 and Formula 2. Um, I came home in 2002 and quickly realized that motor racing was just like the mafia. Once you join, you never leave. Um, and uh, then um, uh, and then worked uh, uh, then worked in V8 supercars. Then Chassis Sim commercially relaunched in um, 2006. And since then, it's basically been used in every major racing category, except, um, uh, for, for, uh, except for Formula One, albeit I do have a F1 based um, OEM customer. Um, so I sort of now regard F1 through the back door. So, um, and really it's pretty much, uh, uh, and, it's, um, and it's pretty much um, evolved from there. So that, yeah, pretty much is a very, very quick introduction to Chassis Sim in about, uh, uh, in about 30 seconds. No, oh, I love it. I love that the baseline to understand how we got to this point. Now, uh, it is my understanding that you're going to kind of walk us through how it works and why it's important. Of course, exactly. exactly. We want everybody so what, to know that there will be a question and answer portion yep. 
hear you conclude and put that in the chat chat, chat section. But uh, by all means, let us begin, Danny, because I'm very excited. I see you got a book up on Amazon, The Dynamics of the Race Car. It's got a lot of positive feedback, and I'm excited to learn from what you've got here today. Amen to that. And also too, for all, uh, a, sh a shameless self-promotion plug, for those of you who are listening, you can actually get the print version uh, from uh, the uh, directly from the Chassis Sim um, uh, we uh, website. Now, let me share my screen, guys. Um, do, 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 share computer sound and uh, and share. Okie dokie. Is everyone seeing my screen? I am. Okay, cool, 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 cool. Right. Before I get started with um, uh, this, um, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I just want to touch on what you've just seen with Ray Leto. Now, um, very, very quick, um, a very, very quick, shameless um, uh, plug for Ray Leto. Ray is one of the best CFD guys in this business. So particularly with a lot of the stuff that we're going to talk about, the sort of stuff that Ray was talking about really dovetails really nicely into um, what we're um, going um, uh, to be talking about today. Now, one thing that I want to make really, really clear today, what I'm about to discuss, I could literally spend two to three hours on at least. So my apologies in advance if a lot of if a lot of what we're going to discuss today is going to be hitting and missing. But really, what I want to ram home to uh, to everyone tuning in today is is the importance of the following: race car simulation, modern approaches to race car engineering that gets results. And really, for me, this is probably without a shadow of a doubt one of the most important lectures I've probably delivered um, uh, this year because. Make no mistake, these um, uh, graphics here of um, the Jota LMP2 car and the Marinello Motorsport Ferrari 458 car, they're just not there for decoration. These are chassis sim customers out there getting the job done and uh, very much applying um, what we're going to discuss today. So everything we're going to talk about is not going to is not is not going to be esoteric theory. What we're going to talk about today is hard won lessons at the racetrack. So let's get started. Now. One of the great misconceptions in this business is that race car simulation and engineering are thought to be two totally disconnected um, disciplines. And the other thing that you also run into is that most race engineering is still done uh, by trial and error. And what tends to happen is that you think, okay, race car simulation, you do that, then you go off and you um, do race engineering and then you play it like a slot machine at Vegas where you just you know, plug in the money, pull the lever down, and, um, you know, and occasionally you get lucky. I can tell you right now, that completely misses the point of simulation. The big point, and if there's only two things that you guys take away from today, I want you to understand the following two points. The big point that is missed about race car simulation is it forces you to understand your car numerically. And I cannot stress that point enough because once you understand your car numerically, it drives your race engineering. This is the point, guys, where you go from the kids' table to the adults' table. And that's a really, really, really important aspect. So let's get started. Now, first things first, for those of you who aren't familiar with Chassis Sim, let me sort of um, uh, break it down for you. Okay, so you've got a large number of simulation toolboxes, such as the lap time simulation, shaker rig, track replay, and driver in the loop simulation. Um, as both Joe and Francisco alluded to, it's pre pretty much in use in every major category except for the Formula One. We're talking LMP1, P2, DPI, IndyCar, GP2, NASCAR, V8 Supercars and DTM and um, uh, World Rally and the of the iceberg. Now, um, to touch on what Ray spoke about is one of the powers of Chassis Sim is it can reverse engineer tire and aero models from race data. Because make no mistake, ladies and gentlemen, as we're going to discuss shortly, the two gray areas of vehicle dynamics are always going to be tires and aero. Once you understand that, everything else you can measure with a set of scales or a ruler. Once you understand, uh, uh, once you understand that, and um, also to a KNC rig, if you've got access um, to shameless plug there, uh, 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 total shameless plug there for Bob Moore, uh, uh, for Bob Simons over at Morse Measurements. Um, but the thing about Chassis Sim at its uh, uh, at its core is a full fire breathing, twenty one state multi body vehicle dynamic model. At its core, Chassis Sim is actually a lot closer to things like MSC Adams um, car. Altair's, uh, uh, Altair's motion solvers, as opposed to what it's usually classed with some of its other contemporaries. Now, because of that full fire breathing 21 state vehicle dynamic model, what that means is that everything in chassis hands, hand, handle is handled transitly, in particular, 
the lap time simulation. It's the only package on the market that does transient lap time simulation. So it can deal with situations like this. So here we've got a simulated trace of speed, steered angle, throttle, front tire loads, rear tire loads. Take a look at what those tire loads are doing. It's going, see how they're varying? It's going over bumps. That, ladies and gentlemen, is your ace in the hole in chassis sim. Now, this is what you should expect when you've done your job with chassis sim right. What we've got here is actual versus simulation. Colored is actual, uh, uh, colored is actual, simulated is black. So what we've got here is we've got speed, throttle, front dampers, rear dampers, steered angle, lateral G, longitudinal G, front roll and rear roll. That, ladies and gentlemen, is the results of the lap time simulation. And when you have done your job right, this is what you should expect. So um, now the community services announcement is on the way. Let me sort of really frame our discussion today. And here's the thing that I really want to talk about. The two main cur currencies of a race engineer, because this is really going to frame our discussion today. All car performance boils down to grip and stability. That is your stock and trade in race engineering. And the following is a perfect case in point. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Imola 1994, the last time Ayrton Senna ever crossed the start finish line. Now, he was Ayrton Senna in the Williams FW16. Rolling into the 1994 season, everyone was expecting Ayrton Senna was going to go to a 4 4 championship on a magic carpet ride. That car, the, F the blue car there, uh, the dark blue car there, um, had the most aero, it, it had the most downforce, it had the, mo uh, it had the most engine power. But there was one small problem. That car was designed for active suspension system. The FIA in a uh, 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 the FIA in an act of absolutely breathtakingly technical panic um, decided to ban active suspension at the end of 1993. So you had an active car that had a passive system tacked onto it. Consequently, that car there exhibited absolute Jekyll and Hyde handling prop properties, which brought this car here, the Benetton B194, driven. Uh, by Michael Schumacher right into the mix. He was down, I think it was like something, uh, something down like 80 horsepower or about, uh, or about would have been about 10 mile per hour um, uh, down, the, uh, uh, down the straights. Yet the thing about it is this car had been designed for an active, uh, for a passive suspension system from day zero, which meant that um, that car here handled a lot better than that car here. And unfortunately we all know, uh, and we all know what happened 40 seconds later. But that really boils down to the, that really illustrates, ladies and gentlemen, the two main currencies of a race engineer that you have to be dealing with. The other primer, and we're going to get back to this, is how do we define race car stability? Because this is actually something that we in motor racing have done a, uh, have done a very, very um, average job of. So if we take a look at, say, your neutral line versus your steer line, it's a pretty good measure of race car stability, provided you've actually got a pedal, uh, you've got a race car driver who can get the job done. However, to be really specific about this, you need something extra, and that is, we adopt the same full, uh, we adopt the um, same, uh, uh, the same, uh, we adopt a concept from aircraft longitudinal dynamics. That is the concept of the static margin or the stability index. And what we've got here, and what that is measuring is the moment arm between the center of the lateral forces and the center of gravity. And provided that remains behind, uh, uh, provided that uh, uh, the center of your lateral forces remain behind the center of gravity, the car is stable. But the closer you get to that, the, more un, uh, 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 the less um, stable it's going to be. And if you get too close to that and you go over that, that's when your um, drivers start referring to you as the race engineer with rather colorful four-letter expletives. Um, so that really frames our discussion for today. So race car simulation. Now, when we talk about race car simulation, part of the real trap that we fall into when we start talking about race car simulation is that we start to look at it like we do actual data. And you've got to come at it from a different lens. Let me illustrate with you this, with this example. Here is an Indy car on a um, super speedway. So we've got uh, colored as actual, black, uh, uh, black as simulated. So we've got speed, steer's not too bad. Front pitch was the average of the front and the rear damper. So that's okay, could do with a little bit of work, but that's fine. However, take a look at the rear, uh, uh, take a look at the rear pitch or the average of the rear dampers. We've got a very big discrepancy between actual and simulated. Now, most people at this point, look at this and throw their toys out of the pram and say, this simulation's all rubbish, it doesn't work, et cetera, et cetera. And that's pretty much, that's sort of that underbelly just burbling under the surface. But here's where you've got to look at, look at things differently. 
this just illustrated a hole in the error map. And this really rams home the point, uh, ladies and gentlemen, that your simulator, whether it be CFD, whether it be vehicle dynamics, it's a calculator. It is not a magic wand. If you are after a magic wand, ladies and gentlemen, I don't want your business because quite frankly, you're going to be too much hard work. But really, once you understand that this is a calculator and it's going to force you to quantify your car, that is when your race engineering moves onto the whole level. And that really, as I said, I don't expect you guys to remember a lot of what I'm going to say today, but I do expect you to take away. Uh, but if there's one thing you can take away from that is what I've just discussed there. Okay, so to frame our discussion, and this really sort of dovetails in quite nicely with what Ray was talking about. Um, well, first things first, we need to understand the metrics of aerodynamics. That is downforce CLA, drag CDA, and aero balance as um, your percentage of the down uh, of your total uh, of the percent the percentage of your front downforce over your total downforce. Now. Um, this is some, uh, uh, now I realize that particularly in motor racing, we like to talk about you know a certain amount of per, you know pounds or newtons at a certain speed. It's a really little bit of a misnomer, and some of the European guys will use CLs um, as opposed to CLAs. We in chassis sim use CLA for two very very key reasons. Number one, um, CL and CDs um, for aerospace purposes is perfectly fine because you've got one primary aero lifting surface, which is the plane form area of the aircraft. And within reason, a monkey can calculate it. The way that things evolved in um, automotive is we went to frontal, uh, is that we went to frontal area. Perfectly fine for a road car, not particularly repeatable for a race car. So consequently, we start talking about um, CLA as total downforce on a half row V squared, um, where rho is air density, V is in meters, um, uh, per, uh, V is in meters per, uh, uh, per second. Drag is drag on a half row V squared. Okay, aero, ba uh, um, aero balance um, is the is your front downforce divided by your total downforce. And particularly for uh, for our North American viewers here, this bit always gives me a great deal of pleasure because I'm on a one man campaign to convert the United States to metric from Imperial. Um, and that is, um, and that is keep this in strict SI units. Forces are in newtons, speed in meters per second, air density in kilograms per meter cubed. Guys, if you try to do this in Imperial, you will get yourself lost so fast. Um, it's not even funny. And besides, anyone who uses the slug as a measure of, uh, any, any measurement system that uses the slug as its measure of density, as far as I'm concerned, is intellectually flawed. But why did I give you that introduction? Here's the thing that you've got to look at when you start connecting the dots between race data and simulation and everything that Ray was talking about. Your dampers are load cells. What does that give you the ability to do? Calculate error, er, uh, calculate your arrow from race data. And it's a huge, and once you understand that, it's a really big leap. And basically what we've got here is because the dampers are load cells, the load on each corner is given to you by the force of your spring, your initial, uh, uh, your um, your tire spring rate, your damping rate, multiplied mode motion ratio, damper and wheel. And that, ladies and gents, is how you go about calculating your arrow. So this, and one of the great things about simulation is it now forces you to really delve into the data, data to, to truly understand what it's um, telling you. Now, where, now, a really good rough rule of thumb here is that you take this from the end of the longest straight of the circuit. Now, the following is an example that I walk through um, in the Chassis Sim Bootcamp that shows you how you can calculate this from race data. So here I've got a very, very simple formula for example. Um, and look, what we'll do is I'll make this available as a PDF so you guys can work um, through this for your, uh, uh, for your leisure. However, the real nail here is some very, very simple high school mathematics allows you to calculate out the arrow. And that ladies and gentlemen, is a game changer because here's the thing, you no longer to go, oh, I feel that the downforce is doing this. I feel that the downforce is doing that. Well, guess what, ladies and gentlemen, if you wanna feel that the downforce is doing this, the, the downforce is going, uh, going to do that, go to a hipster vegan cafe Drink a soy cappuccino, and um, and while you're enjoying your to uh, while, uh, and while you're enjoying a tofu burger, um, uh, you can spare a thought for those guys who are actually out there getting the job done and eating the real meat. Um, now I realise that probably will probably annoy a few vegans who have um, uh, uh, tuned in here, but at least it'll get your attention. But the point about it is though, is this allows you. It's very, very simple high school mathematics, but it blows me away the amount of race engineers and performance engineers who can't do this to save themselves, yet it is so simple. 
And ladies and gentlemen, once you learn how to do this, it transforms the way that you look at data. You will never ever be a slave to basically, uh, 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 you will never be a slave to um, what a race car manufacturer tells you or uh, that thing, oh, we can't do, uh, uh, we can't, uh, yeah, we don't have an error map, therefore we can't simulate. Ladies and gentlemen, if I have $5 for every time I had that, I tell you what, I would not be here today. I would be a retired gentleman of leisure, uh, uh, living um, uh, 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 living a life of um, uh, paradise in the sub, uh, uh, you know, in a beautiful subtropical beach. But I'm here with you, good folk. But that shows you just how um, important that is. And particularly to the younger engineers who are tuning, tuning into this, if you are an undergrad or a recent postgrad, if you're working for me and you can't do that, I will fire your ass. So uh, don't leave home without it. Okay, some rough rules of thumb to get your heads around uh, around this. CLAs for a touring car, we're talking TCR. Um, uh, we're, we're talking TCR. V8 supercars are probably to the higher end of this, but we're talking about 0.5 to 1.4, CDA is 0.9 to 1.3. Now in that, and the, in um, the uh, uh, grander scheme of things, um, that's basically a full stop. Now, FAA GT3, GT2 is about 1.7. That actually goes to about three. And NASCAR sort of lives at those higher CLA numbers. CDA is about 0.9 to 1.3, um, depending on um, your category of car. F3 or equivalent, you're looking at about one and a half to 2.7, but the FIA spec and US spec F3 goes to about three and a half. CDA is about 0.7 to 1.1. Um, the old 3000 cars um, are about 2.4 to 2.7. 1.2 to 1.3. Indy cars about a CLA of three to four and a half um, with a CDA of 1.4 to 1.7. Uh, for those of us, uh, for those of you tuning in from Europe, F2 is about those same sort of numbers, except the CDAs drop a bit. And LMP2 slash Daytona prototype, you're looking at about 3.7, a CLA of 3.7 3 to 5. CDA is about 0.9 to 1.2. So why have you bothered um, listening to um, this little tirade about how to calculate aero? Here's why. Here's the payoff, ladies and gentlemen. It allows you to generate and read an aero map. Consider that this little down. Uh, uh, consider this downforce map for an LMP2 car, which um, we uh, rolled out for the chassis competition that we ran earlier in the year. If we take a look, this tells you the ride height envelope you need to be in the high speed corners. You get the ride height there in turn into mid corner. It's money for jam. So particularly if you're at places like Road America, if you're at places like Daytona, Sebring, um, well, particularly if you're on um, uh, the um, endurance course as opposed to um, the small, the smaller course the Indy cars are on, um, you know, the, the uh, places, uh, 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 places like like Mosport, Le Mans. This is money for jam. This allows you to truly understand what to do with the car. And by using our simulation tools and by using our data, we're sort of bringing this all together. So again, don't leave home without it. Okay, tire modeling, why you don't leave home without it. Now, when we talk about tire modeling, this is usually the sort of stuff enough to send grown men screaming into the hills for sheer terror. Um, and I got to admit, the first time I saw a Pajaka formulation, um, I got 84% pure maps free in my undergrad. And the first time, uh, you know, when the first time I saw a, a Pajaka formulation, my first reaction was, well, F me. And of course, that's the PG, the, uh, that's of course the PG 13 version. Um, now, the thing about tire modeling, ladies and gentlemen, is here's the following the key to get right is the traction circle radius versus load characteristic of the tire. You get that right, everything falls into place. For those of you who've seen the original Karate Kid, to quote Mr. Miyagi, balance good, karate, good. Balance bad, you better pack up and go home. This is um, the tire modeling analogy. And the sole of your tire is given by this. The traction circle radius is your initial coefficient of friction, one minus KB times the uh, KB times the ver uh, times the vertical load, all multiplied by the vertical load of the tire. KA is the initial coefficient of friction. KB is how that coefficient of friction drops off um, the tire load. FZ is the load on the tire. So why do why do we bother get, uh, why do we bother trying to put us all this together? Here's why: because every tire can be expressed as its initial coefficient of friction and the load at which. Um, it generates its max grip. And make no mistake, ladies and gentlemen, once you understand how to use race data to fill in that gap, it will transform the way you set up your race car. Here's why. If you typically, if the loads you see on track are about here, so they're about, say, 20% away from the peak load of um, your generator that you see on track, here's the thing. It tells you soft springs, 
soft damping ratios, high roll centers, high pitch centers. You basically, the tire needs a lover with a slow hand. However, if you're now looking at, say your peak load is about 50% less than the peak load where the tire generates it grips, that's telling you low roll centers, stiff bar, stiff springs, high damping ratios. Why? The tire needs to be worked and it needs to be worked hard. And once you wonder, and what I'm about to show you is a really powerful technique about how you can generate this from race data. And make no mistake, ladies and gentlemen, if I had $10 for the amount of time I've, uh, I've heard the thing, oh, we can't do simulation, we don't, have, um, uh, we don't have tire data, let's put it this way, I'd have more money than Jeff Bezos and Warren Buffett combined. Um, and make no, uh, but, also make, uh, uh, but also make no mistake, one of the worst kept secrets in this business is how most lateral and longitudinal forces versus slip ratio uh, versus slip angle and slip ratio are pretty much there purely for decoration. What I'm about to show you will get you a usable tire model really quickly. So, okay, the first thing we need to understand is where are the peak tire loads we're seeing on track. Now, to do that, we can do two things. Number one, we can fit strain gauges to the car. The problem with uh, with load cells and strain gauges to the car, they're a little bit like fish and chips in romantic movies. They're either really really good or they're really really bad and there is no in uh, and um uh, there's no in between and um fellas if your missus has ever forced you to sit through a really really bad romantic movie you'll know exactly what i'm talking about um so what we're, uh, so the uh, but the other way we can do this is through a rough simulation model because here's the thing um air, uh, whether it be chassis sim whether it be any uh, any other of my contemporaries tire loads will pop out in the wash so what you can do is that you can go through, see where your peak tire loads is with a very, very rough correlation model. And then you'll typically add about for an initial guess, 30% of the peak load. Now, once you've got that, we now need to estimate the initial coefficient of friction of the tire. To do that, we do a very, very simple force balance. And that is your rear and lateral forces are your weight distribution to the front, MT times IRVX squared, and your and um, your rear forces is one is your weight distribution of the rear times MT times IRVX squared. Now, this I go to in a little bit more depth um, in the Chassisium YouTube um, in the Chassisium YouTube channel, and I also discuss this at length in the Chassisium boot camps. Now, so the great thing about all this is that you can combine all this into an Excel sheet. Now, the great thing about combining this into an Excel sheet, this Excel sheet is a little bit like the Millennium Falcon from Star Wars. It doesn't look like much, but it's got it where it counts. Um, vis -a -vis, it allows you to predict your cornering speeds and it allows you to get a base tire model. But once you've got that base tire model, you can then plug it into chassis sim and then use the chassis sim tire force modeling to fill in the gaps. Make no mistake, ladies and gentlemen, once we started that technique, would have been about four or five years ago in the chassis sim community, we went from doing tire modeling in about a week to two weeks to days. This is a really, really powerful first cut technique to get yourself into the ballpark. But the question is, now I know some of you at this point might have, been, uh, uh, might have tuned out here is, why bother doing all this? Here's why. Once you have a tire model, it allows you to really explain the magic, beside, uh, uh, the magic behind the so-called magic number, which is the lateral load transfer distribution at the front, because that gives you your first cut of grip and stability. So here we've got lateral, uh, we've got lateral load transfer distribution versus total force. So here we've got a uh, uh, here we've got a variation of about a thousand newtons over a total force of about um, twenty two thousand newtons. So that's about five or six percent. But the big thing that varies is the stability index, which is that thing we talked about before the non dimensionalized static margin. Take a look at how that varies. Where this is static margin. This is static margin divided by 100. Take a look at how that is varying. And uh, that, and if you're start, starting to look at a variance of about 10% of static margin, that's the big, that's a huge difference to she's understeering like a pig to, oh my God, the car's got me. So the dance that we dance as race engineers is pretty much maximizing where that grip is to the stability the driver can put up with. And everything that we've just walked through about how to do aero modeling, about how to do tire modeling, allows you to do this numerically. Your days of going through, putting your finger, putting your finger in the air going, oh yeah, I feel that it's gonna, uh, I feel that it's gonna do, uh, I feel it's gonna do this. Those days are now over. 
with that sort of approach, you've now got the ability to nail this down with numbers. And make no mistake, ladies and gentlemen, once you start engineering that way, it's going to, uh, 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 to quote Obi-Wan Kenobi from Star Wars when he was instructing Luke Skywalker in his first, um, in his, um, first uh, episodes into the Force, it's taking your first steps into a much larger world. So that all being said, how do we now actually employ the simulation? And, uh, and what do we, uh, uh, how do we employ the simulation and what do we focus on? Okay, first things first, quantifying setup changes. If we take a look at um, a, a 2D tire model, great for correlation. But if you take a look at the nature of the model, when we start um, looking at the, uh, at the set of the setup variables that we use as, ra uh, as race engineers, the actual changes from setup to setup are very, very small. Let me give an example of this. Here's a very, very rough example of a V8 supercar. So here we've got an initial coefficient, uh, uh, coefficient of friction of 2.2 and a peak load of about 850 kilos. So when we go through and start evaluating what that means, and, uh, and let me give you an example of that. With the old live axle cars, a huge go-to change was moving um, uh, the rear roll center up and down by a 10 mil by varying the watts length. Now, these were the things the drivers would swear, black and blue was the biggest change in the world. But if we take a look at the forces, those forces are really small. If we take a look at this example between a rear roll center of 240 mil and 250 mil, you're barely looking at differences of about three kilograms force. Now, there are obviously some other bits and pieces that are going to interact with this, like for example, how the stability index is gonna change. But here's the thing, it's, gonna, it's actually gonna, uh, 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 it's gonna err more to the conservative side than it is to um uh, 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 that it is um to um oh my god this is the biggest change you'll ever deal with so this really rams home how you need to look at simulated data the changes that you will do on your simulator are always going to be smaller than actual data reason one for the reason we just discussed reason two a simulator has no concept of its own mortality chassis sim is the terminator it ha it does not know mercy it does not know pity and it absolutely will, it knows exactly where the grip is, and it absolutely will not stop until maximum grip has been achieved. And so consequently, when you start looking at simulated data, you, uh, the changes in steer angle, throttle are gonna be very, very small, but the, where it will really make its presence felt is, 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 speed, is mid corner speeds. That's the way that you look at what a simulator is telling you. And once you understand that, that allows you to open up your mind properly. And that's a really, really important, uh, uh, that's a, and that is the key differential between looking at simulated to actual data. Okay, so here are some rough rules of thumb about um, uh, what your simulator means. So 0.1 to 0.2K an hour, that's, a big, that's gonna be a mild change. 0.2 to 0.6K an hour, that's moderate. Anything over about 0.6K an hour, that's hallelujah, be praised, Jesus sort of territory. This is the sort of stuff that you absolutely sit down and you, and you, uh, and you absolutely say, uh, and, you, and you give thanks to your uh, religious honcho of choice to say, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, now, the other thing that you're also looking for is small and consistent changes. Here's some work I did for a um, amateur driver um, in the um, v, uh, in um, the V to V category. This is basically, for, for lack of a better term, LMP4. So what we've got here is that we've got a uh, we've got consistent cha uh, consistent changes um, in the C time, very small changes in the speed time. That's an example of a good simulated change. Now, correlation. What do you focus on? Okay, so here are some rough rules of thumb: 80 to 120k an hour. Um, that's going to be you want that to be within about one to two k. 120 to 160k an hour, you want that to be about two to three k an hour. 160k an hour, three to four k an hour is good enough. The exception that proves the rules for this is ovals, and the reason that ovals are the exception that proves the rules, the number one thing you've got to get right in an oval is matching the tire loads. However, the following is an example of this is correlation that is good enough. Um, what we've got here, actual is colored, simulated is black. So what we've got here is, um, you know, the dampers aren't too bad, but some of the speeds are off. That's okay. That's an amateur driver. That correlation formed the basis for that particular, um, uh, for that particular small race team to be able to do, uh, to be able to make really good ground on things like suspension geometry and dampers. The other thing that I also want to say about correlation is make no mistake, really good correlation cell simulators. I mean, that correlation I showed you at the top of the hour, that's what I call my simulator porn shot. What it does 
is uh, uh, what that, I mean, it sells, it sells simulators. It gets team managers and drivers all hot and bothered. But the thing about it is correlation is a byproduct. If you go cor chasing correlation in and of itself, you will be forever doomed to disappointment. Correlation comes as a byproduct. As you match the aero model, as you match the tire models, as you measure up the car properly, the correlation, and as you work on the tire model, these things come to you. But if you go chasing it, um, using all sorts of um, fudge factors, et cetera, et cetera, you will be forever doomed. Uh, you will be forever doomed to disappointment. Okay, some rules of thumb and how to use simulation. Okay, so here's an example of a um, simulation um, that I ran um, for a customer of mine in the Pro Class and Time Attack. Um, and that's uh, and uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with the, with the Time Attack category, it's very, very analogous to the open category in Pikes Peak. So what we've got here is that we've got speed, we've got uh, the front and the rear average dampers, we've got ride heights, and we've got bump rubber displacement. Now here, I was using the simulator like a calculator. I couldn't have, uh, I couldn't have given, uh, I couldn't have given two hoots about the lap time. What I was looking for was, okay, I knew approximately I would hand capped out the downforce and I needed to know where I needed to be in my bump rubber package. And I used that as my basis um, to make sure that my ride heights were okay, but more importantly, to design a really solid bump rubber package. And that actually worked out and it worked out really, really, really well. But that, ladies and gentlemen, shows you how you use simulation as a calculator. This is where, you know, the importance of understanding our error map, understanding our tires, this is where all this comes together. Some other rough rules of thumb on um, how to use um, simulation. Okay, so spring rates, plus or minus 20% of the base setup. Keep damping ratios to known values of the base setup. Suspension geometry, plus or minus 20% of your standard roll, roll center migration. That being said, if you're using something like the Shaker Rig Toolbox, you can actually lean a bit on, uh, you can go a little bit more adventurous on um, your um, on um, your damper curves. Um, you can lean on the camber changes, bars within plus or minus 30% of the base setup. But but the other thing too, particularly to the younger engineers who are tuning in, uh, are tuning into this, because once upon a time, I used to be you. I used to be like you. I was thinner. I had more hair. And also too, I used to be a, a, a um, I used to be able to, um, uh, um, uh, I used to, I, I would charge up and try to be per uh, be perfect. Trust me, you are going to get more headway if you start from a well-known model and modify it to suit. And I cannot stress that point enough. So. Let's talk about how this all came together. And this is, I think, a really, really powerful case study about when your race car simulation really drives your race engineering. And that is um, simulation in action, the 24 hours of Le Mans. So it was the setup days of Le Mans 2019. I was um, doing my rounds, seeing my customers. And I had a good friend of mine who was working for a team that had just graduated from LMP3 into LMP2 and we're doing it at Le Mans. And he took one look at me and um, he just said, buddy, um, my, reproductive or uh, my reproductive organs are on the chopping block here. Um, and I just said, what is that, mate? They just, he just said, we're in a bad situation, et cetera, et cetera. So pretty much everything we've just discussed about constructing an aero map, constructing a tire model, bring it all together. What I did for this particular team, and because, I was, because he was a good mate and I'm a soft touch, um, I basically had to dive in and do some stuff and, and do a lot of stuff very, very quickly. And everything that I'm about to talk to you guys about, I did in two to four hour sessions. So really for me, this really shatters the myth that race car simulation is something that you have to spend months and months developing. And then, you know, you use it, uh, then you use it very, very, sper uh, very, very sparingly. But again, this was sort of the culmination of what happens when you understand a car numerically. So the first thing to do was to, cal it was to calibrate the arrow. And because there was so little time, um, biggest return on investment, focusing on end of straight correlation. So what we've got here is green was the initial data. Black was the first simulation run. Um, red was where we got to. Now, um, I was a little bit in a good situation here in the fact that uh, uh, I was a little bit in a good situation here in the fact that I had a good base model put together by one of my students. Um, however, because the map was um, purely from CFD, there was a lot of work that needed to be done. Now, so, tip, uh, so focusing on um, uh, the, um, uh, the end of straight correlation, um, so the CLA max had to be dropped down by 9%. CDA max could stay, uh, uh, was fortunate enough to stay as is, and the error balance had to move plus 4%. 
That being said, though, guys, this is about what you'd expect from CFD results. I mean, don't get me wrong. The stuff that Ray does is really, really good. But whether you're talking about stuff from CFD, whether you talk about a wind tunnel, just remember, these tools are dinos. This is not facsimile from God Almighty himself. So you're always going to have to do a little bit of calibration to actual, um, uh, uh, to, um, uh, to actual data. So once that was done, um, I then went through and did a rough, um, cal cal uh, a rough calibration on the cornering speeds. Now, because chassis sim is transient, I focused on getting the altitude road camber right, getting the bump scale factor right, and then tuning in um, with the grip scale factors. And the following was the end result. Now, this wasn't perfect correlation, but it was good enough to get uh, but it was good enough to get started. Remember, this was done in one four hour session, ladies and gentlemen. There wasn't, uh, uh, um, you know, this, uh, uh, the, you know, I had to move. Uh, I had to move quickly. So once that was done, it was time to for the second four hour session. It was time to move on to, uh, to tuning the aero map, and we had to get the car in the aero sweet spot. So. What I did, and particularly if you take a look at a place like Le Mans, when you take a look at like the Porsche curves, Indianapolis, Tetla Rouge, we're talking cornering speeds, 160, 220, 240, 260K, uh, uh, 240K an hour for an LMP2 car, it's higher for a P1 car. So making sure that you got the car, the ride height envelope in the aero sweet spot for the turn in and mid corner sections of the turn, it's money for jam, ladies and gentlemen. And it's like, you know, it's like taking, it's like taking candy from a baby. Um, so what, uh, so what we did was we focused on tuning in the third spring. So where we really got the greatest return on investment was the problem is the rear third spring was set way too stiff. And what was happening is that the car was basically at an attitude, like, uh, the car was at an attitude like this. So it was well out of the aero sweet spot. So what we did was we softened up the third spring and got it down to here. And as we can see in the data, the front pitch wasn't too bad. As you can, uh, um, the baseline was colored. Black was where we got to. If we take a look at the rear pitch, that was when that um, that was uh, getting that rear um, uh, to sit down. And it basically it allowed the rear platform to sit down a little bit better. And it basically picked up two to three K an hour in um, uh, two to three K an hour in those high speed turns. That's when I knew, okay, that's when I turned around to Roberto and I said, okay, put this on the car. This isn't a, this isn't a, uh, this isn't a debate. The next thing I did was I had a, uh, as I cranked out the shaker rig toolbox and went through some of the damp, uh, some of the um, damping options. And here was using the shaker rig toolbox, which is basically conducting a whole bunch of frequency swept sign tests um, to see where we could go with the dampers. Now here, I didn't make a lot of ground with the contact patch load variation, which measures the tire load variation as it goes over the bumps. But what I did do was, you know, the amplitudes were about the same, but the cross pitch mode changed quite significantly. And this is a little tip that I picked up from a uh, paper, an SEA paper uh, released by Henry Kolshawak, who runs um, the ARC rig um, in Indianapolis. Now, it's not that often that a proper grown up will write about what they did on the shaker rig. Um, but that was a really, really um, good, uh, a, a good rule of thumb for me to adopt and has served me very, uh, and has um, served me very, very well. But that really allowed a direction for these guys to go um, with damping. But because of the time constraints, they really didn't get time to put it on the car, but I threw it to Roberto was an option. So what was the end result of all this? Okay, the initial goal was to make sure they didn't run last. Job done. Yay, Roberto kept his reproductive organs. Um, uh, however, what happened was because they, they now had such a good basis, they could now tune the other stuff to get um, the setup to come to uh, to get the car to get the car from, uh, to the circuit, and the end result was in the P two category. They were fourth in the morning warm up, so they had um, uh, they had a quick car. That, ladies and gentlemen, just shows you really the power that you've got um, with um, race car simulation. Now, so to wrap things up before we start the QA, okay. Here's the thing about race car simulation: it forces you to quantify your car. That is so so important, ladies and gentlemen. We saw that dampers. You can view them as load cells and with a, and a basic tire model can yield so much about the car. But here's the nail, ladies and gentlemen, it forces you to race engineer the car numerically. Make no mistake, ladies and gentlemen. Yes, I know the squiggly lines are very sexy, but the real nail is that that is the full stop at the end of the process. What you learn is everything to generate those squiggly lines um, in the, uh, um, in, uh, in the first, uh, um, um, in the first place. So, let me now at that point um, conclude the formal part of the presentation. And now let me turn it over to Q&A. Wow. 
that. Danny, that was tremendous, first of all. Um, we have advanced the ball tremendously. I have a question. I do invite all of our people out there to uh, put their questions up in the chat section and we'll go through them. Uh, there is a lot of information there, but anytime you can throw in Money for Jam, a Karate Kid reference, Star Wars, and all of that into understanding of chassis simulation, I'm loving what I am here. <laughs> so thank you for that. Uh, maybe uh, continue on, but for folks out there who have a question, please put it into your uh, chat section. In the meantime, Danny, how did race engineers do all of this before this tool? Trial and error. Um, and actually, to be quite honest, I mean, uh, let me give you a direct quote from one of my motorsport mentors um, who, um, I mean, look, I mean, he used to race a formula, a guy by the name of Brian Island. He used to race um, Formula Free um, with, um, he used to race Formula Free with the likes of Ricardo Patrese and Nigel Mansell. And he said to me, everything we did before this, it was just trial and error. We would literally throw something at it. And it was it was almost literally hit, it was almost literally hit and hope. Um, and um, when I started to work, uh, uh, so when he started the first few simulation, some of my contemporaries said this is not too bad. But then when I started to work with him, he just figured. Um, he looked at me and he said, "I don't know how I survived before I actually use this." Um, and and primarily because of the fact that with everything, uh, and that was actually a really good example of how I worked with him because we uh, worked together on the first A1 GP, the first generation A1 GP car. And the thing about that A1 GP car is what should have been a really straightforward process because it was basically the old Lola 3000 cars. Um, the guy who used to run, uh, the guy, the figurehead of A1 GP was Sheikh Maktum El Makmak El Makmak El Makmak El Makmak El Makmak Tum, um, Sheikh Mak for short. And um, he insisted that the car looked like a shark um, and had tires the size of the Batmobile. Uh, um, so consequently, what should have, so all the setups that did work for those 3000 cars went flying out the window. And using that approach that we talked about, about how to quantify your aero, quantifying your tires from race data, um, pretty much transformed the way that he would go about engineering the car. These are all at uh, come across as uh, high level engineering, but there's so much racing that goes on in the world. Uh, where is the the break for someone who would want to use this? I know that there, there are a lot of club racers, smaller racers that right. racing is, is, is part of it. They want to challenge themselves. And this looks like something that they would like. Okay. To so let me, so to any club racers who are tuning into this, Okay, let me sort of, um, let me break down um, uh, one of the sacred cows slash huge myths of this business that you need to have $40,000 worth of data acquisition to use simulation. That's a total nonsense. Here is pretty much what you can get to about, you know, 90, 95, uh, uh, to about a, a good 85, 90%. Damper pots, steer sensors, um, uh, 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 um, uh, damper pots, steer sensors, um, throttle, steer angle, and a good, you know, and a good triaxis G meter. You have all those things. You can pretty much do everything that we've just discussed. Wow, amazing stuff! Now we're running a little short on time, getting close to the end. This has been an amazing day one. Danny, is there anything you want to drive home the point for the folks out there who are watching now or in the future uh, about chassis sim, how it will work for them, and most importantly, uh, how to go about getting it or getting involved? Okay, so number one, you can get involved on the um, uh, you can get involved in the Shasim website. Uh, probably your entry point is the online simulation on Shasim.com. Now, I just had a, a, a question um, uh, fly up in the chat about um, the LMP2 competition that we ran earlier this year. Um, yes, the um, results, um, uh, what you can learn from that, that is all on, on the Shasim YouTube channel and the website. Tremendous. Uh, one of the other uh, gentlemen down there have been using Chassis Sim since 2010. Strongly, strongly recommend for any uh, engineering group. And uh, that seems to be the common review that once you get it, uh, this is a mandatory item. Yep, absolutely. Yep, absolutely. Uh, very exciting. Uh, I've learned a lot. I know a lot of our audience have as well. I like the idea of taking first steps into a much larger world and having that as a, you know, an arrow in your quill when you're going to going to fight on the racetrack out there. Uh, and instead yep. of guessing, right? Isn't that what everything is about? That is just right. And make no mistake. Like uh, also too, just notice a few things coming up, uh, coming up in the chat as well. There's like, sure. uh, there are uh, uh, eight, uh, eight um, uh, seems to be like eight um, uh, chats um, uh, there. But um, look, 
I cannot stress enough what you get out of simulation. Just remember the squiggly lines, the driver in the loop stuff. Yeah, it looks sexy. It gets some. Um, it gets team management and drivers um, all excited. But uh, uh, but I can tell. But I can tell you right now, the big thing is it forces you to understand the car numerically and quantify it numerically. Once you understand that, your whole world opens up. That is amazing. And um, once your world opens up, as you say, and I can imagine, uh, as much as you joked about basic high school math, they didn't teach that in my high school, Danny, but uh, we have you directly. Um, that gives you more options, right? That gives you options. Absolutely. Well, let me quote my, let me quote my US dealer, John Hayes. Um, now, John, the thing I love about uh, uh, the thing about I love about John is that he's actually not a degree qualified engineer. He's basically a race mechanic who grew into race engineering. He said to me, "Here's the thing about truly being able to quantify your car. You can get up onto uh, you know onto the pit wall, and you are not guessing. You are totally prepared. There's no ifs, ands, or buts." Excellent, excellent, Danny. Thank you very much. This was tremendous. Chassis Sam, go to epartstrade.com. I see and see Skatir. And now I think he can actually begin drinking. Like, I think now. I, I, I think you're right. I think we need But you know what? Yeah, yeah. But, you, but you know what? I'm about to shatter. I'm about to shatter. Yeah, I'm about, I'm about to shatter one of your sacred cows, Francisc. I'm a teetotaler. I drink non-alcoholic beer. Um, I know. So, I know you do, Danny. I know you yes, do. I, you I know you attack to the vegans, Danny. You attack Yeah, the well, oh, look, look. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. What can I say? I've known a, I've, I've known a few vegans during my time. And, uh, well, to quote, uh, uh, yeah, um, all I can say is those of us tuning in, JPC is ultra spiritual channel. If meat eaters acted like vegans, it just says it all. <laughs> Danny, Danny is wonderful. He makes things, you know, so simple. I mean, it's just he has that talent to make the most incredibly complicated things fascinating. And, and Danny, I'm delighted. To, to have you part of uh, Online Race Industry Week. You were terrific. I have seen many of your presentation and uh, please send my best to Adele and to all our friends in Australia. And so thank you very, very much. Registering on ePartrade is easy. Fill out your name, email, phone number, and create a secure password. Next, select your business type. Choose supplier if you're looking to display products or services and connect with buyers. Choose racing business if you're looking to find new parts and connect with suppliers. Choose race team if you own or are a member of a professional racing team. Begin typing your company name. We most likely already have your company in our database, which you can select from the drop-down. Then, enter your job title. Choose Claim Company if you'll be editing your company profile. Other members of your company can choose Join Company if they'd like to use ePartrade as well. You can view and agree to our terms of use here. If you'd like to receive our weekly newsletter, choose Accept. Click Register Now and your registration will be submitted for approval. You'll need to confirm your email once it goes through. To keep our platform industry only, you'll be approved shortly after. If we require additional proof of business, we'll reach out. Welcome to ePartrade.